Hi, welcome to Outlaw Bookseller, the voice of experience in SF. 39 years in the book trade, reading SF for 50 years, all that sort of stuff. Author of 100 must-read science fiction novels. There's a few credentials for you. So we're going to talk today about why the contemporary science fiction, the newly published science fiction that you're reading from the last few years, last 10, 20 years and beyond that, isn't modern. It isn't modernist. And this isn't just going to be a semantic argument. We've had these things before when I've talked about the difference between meaning and usage. This is how about we use the word modern and how we don't use the word modernist and how the SF that you're reading now this coming out now with a handful of small exceptions and the exceptions that make the rule isn't modern. I've hinted this video for a long time. You'll understand it better if you've watched my hauntology and psychogeography videos, particularly the hauntology and SF one, which is about why you like the books with the old covers. That's what it's called. Why you like the SF books with the old covers. So if you've not watched them, watch them after this. I'll link them at the end of the video because they are supportive of this. But this should be self-contained. So, you know, the word modern is generally used in an everyday sense in most YouTube videos about science fiction. Modern literally means just now. It just happened. It's also regarded as indicating what's up to date, what's current, what is on trend, the new, the thing what's happening now, the progressive, the moving forward. Think about all these things. Think about newness, about current things, trends and fashions. They're all tied up with consumerism, with us buying things so that we feel modern, we feel up to date, we feel on trend. Why do we feel we need to be up to date and on trend and modern? As I'll show, this urge isn't new at all. It's a couple of centuries old at least. And the other usage of the word modern, which is the one I really want to talk about, is that used by philosophers, historians of the arts and cultural critics. So if you're looking at things in a historical sense, modern means something different instead of just what's up to date, what's happening now. That's contemporary. So really, when we're talking about what's happening now, we should use the word contemporary because Modern is also a period of time and that time is over. So as a writer and critic and SF reader all my life, I believe the historical context is vital to understanding SF, to appreciating it and enhancing your enjoyment of it. Because the more you understand something, the more you enjoy it. That is the way it is. So I use the word modern to indicate the period of time in cultural production, and cultural production is the making and creation of books, music, film, and other arts. Modern is an historical period, okay? It's an historical period. However, your view of the context that you see things will be affected by your age and relative experience. So for example, in SF, what your view of what modern is will change as you age and learn more. You will naturally, when you're young, be engaged with the zeitgeist, the spirit of the age, what's happening now. And that's absolutely the way it should be. And it's the way it is. And it's definitely the way I was when I was much younger. So when was modern and what is modernism and how does it relate to SF? What I'm going to call SF produced from around 1990 onwards is contemporary. Contemporary is a better and more accurate term in terms of the history of the arts, the history of literature for now and recent than modern. Modern is a period that's gone. We should say contemporary because we live in the contemporary moment. And as you will see, modern is something which is gone. So to begin the discussion about SF and why modern isn't what you're reading, we need to look at the novel. The novel as a form had been evolving for centuries and centuries. You know, it comes from very old roots and it really became a thing around about the time of what's known as the Enlightenment. That's the period in the late 18th century, in the late sort of 1700s, when scientific method, rationalism, began to become more dominant in people's lives and it coincided with radical political movements like the French Revolution and really it's when 
the sort of world we have today, an eager, more egalitarian world, or a world which we are hoping is more egalitarian and inclusive for everybody, really started to happen, radical political movements. And the novel became the popular and dominant literary form around that time. Now, the word novel is derived from novelty, a fresh, engaging, a new idea, new idea, novel, novelty, new, and the concept of the idea at the heart of it. So the novel had novelty, and it also had a new thing in it, the novum. Novum means new thing, and I've identified the novum, the new idea that's at the heart of an SF story, as being the thing. And all these words derive from new. So the SF novel is a definitive form of novel because it depends on a novel idea, a new idea, an idea with novelty. Now in the late 19th century, the novel was new and it was modern. Everybody you could read was excited by the novel. Before the novel became a regular thing, and there were lots of proto novels and things before that, but when it became a popular mass thing, mass reproduced by lots of printing, and this is an important point we'll come back to later, people read sermons and poetry in the West. This is what they read. And you've got to remember that the number of people who were literate worldwide was quite small. And the novel has become our dominant mode of narrative. You can talk all you like about films, but loads of them <laughs> based on novels. They begin in writing. They begin in plot. They begin in story. So people were reading sermons and poetry. So when the novel became a thing, it was really important. So the Enlightenment was that moment when the champion of science and new politics and a rejection of superstition, religion and magic, they became embodied in the novel. First came the soap opera realism of people like Richardson and Austin, who went into the sort of detail in people's lives, the soap opera detail, which people found really engaging. They really engage with the characters. And that was a new thing. Characters ceased to be archetypes and started to be genuine, fully rounded people. And that was really, really key in the development of the novel. So around about that time, a little bit later, you had the science-based what-if speculation of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. There's the 1818 text, that's the one to read, that's the one which is 5% of the text in Percy Bysshe Shelley's hand. And that was a really important point because that era is known as Romanticism. It comes shortly after the Enlightenment where people were worried that everything was getting a little bit too clockwork, a little bit too scientific, a little bit too deterministic. And there's a bit of reaction against that in order to bring humanism back into things. This sort of coincidence, coincidence of Frankenstein with the Enlightenment worldview that sees many critics picking the book as the moment when science fiction is born out of the primal foam of proto-SF. Now, proto-SF, science fiction before it was science fiction, is something you could spend your life looking at. It goes right the way back to Lucian of Samosata. You know, this dialogue started way, way back in the 1960s and before. There's all sorts of precursors. But of course, do we really have science fiction before we have science? That's for another time. So if you want to look at the issues around Frankenstein romanticism and how it links to something in cyberpunk, the sublime, there is a video on the channel um, called Frankenstein, Cyberpunk and the Sublime. I think I'll put a link up in it and that will show you how SF links back to that key moment in sort of human culture and development. So science fiction between Frankenstein and 1925, 1926, when the term science fiction was coined, even though it was used briefly once in a poetry magazine in Scandinavia in about the 1870s, but about something different. That period between Frankenstein and Hugo Gernsback's coining of science fiction, which was then changed to science fiction by a fan a year later, was scientific romance. So that's the sort of nascent period where it's all really coming together. In that period, we have Shelley, Poe, Verne, Wells, the sort of founding mothers and fathers of modern genre SF. And you note I say modern and even contemporary SF is included in that. Modernism is an historical epoch and it's an artistic period and movement and that comes a little bit later. It comes in the late 19th century after and during the late Industrial Revolution where science changed the world, technology changed the world and during this time printing technology really advanced, mass production became a thing, photography appeared, 
film appeared, an audio recording. They were all born during the Industrial Revolution up to the early 20th century. So you've got to look at that and think about the implications of it. Before those moments, it was really hard for people to see or hear works of art. Music, you'd only hear live performed by musicians. There's no recordings. There was no film and photography. There was only painting and drawing and only a small number of people could read. So really, that's when modernism begins. The modern world starts to come together with mass production, industrial revolution, capitalism, mass reproduction. Towards the end of the 19th century, you start to get modern art. Impressionism appears in fine art and starts to break down the idea that a painting has to perfectly reproduce something. Because, of course, photography is upset. It. Photography is pushing representational art out of the window. In literature, you have decadence and symbolism where the novelist had to move on and a pure representation of the social life of characters isn't enough and there are more things that need to be said and there are outsiders who want to say them. You see the stirrings of mass market category genre fiction in mass print publishing. You see the beginning of the coalescence of genres of horror, westerns, of the crime story, SF. All that begins. Photography continues to push back against realism in painting and painters gradually turn to abstraction, inner space what the artist feels, perceives and wants to convey rather than what's actually out there for us all to see. So at the dawn of the 20th century, ordinary people are confronted for the first time with the richness of cultural production. Printed matter is everywhere. Music recordings. Film is there. Photography. And not just ordinary people, but the rich as well. If you think the richest person in the world way back before, you know, the middle of the 19th century, they, they would never, they could travel the world, but they would never see all the art, they would never see all the culture, because there wasn't film and photography, and you didn't live long enough or weren't rich enough to see everything. So that was just for the elites. But as we got to the 20th century with mass reproduction, it was a possibility for us all. So it was once a thing for the privileged, but what happened was that all of us, ordinary people growing up in the 20th century, we would be exposed to enormous amounts of art during our lifetime. We would discover it when we were young, we would read, we would see films, we would see pictures, we would see reproductions of things, and it just filled us up. So mass production created the mass media. It filled us up with all these images and literature and so on. The Industrial Revolution sold us this art. People before that were starved of novelty. The new developed slowly. We got used to new things coming along all the time, to being on trend. You know, what's the news? Why are we so interested in the now? Because the whole means of production through mass reproduction was there for us. So it could present us with novelties and keep us entertained and let us enjoy it all the time. So what happened in the 20th century and since then is we've glutted ourselves on all of it. We were the first people in human history to do this. And this has altered our consciousness. And it's almost a science fiction thing in itself. The way people thought and the way people responded was slower, more considered, and they were less stimulated than we are. We are overstimulated. We're habituated to the idea of the new, the modern and the contemporary. And if you're an older person, if you really were born and grew up in that century, you know, it completely overtook your head. And it's only later when you discover the history of cultural production, the history of mass production and the history of the world before that, that you realise that you're living and have lived in a unique time, a time there's never been anything like in human history. So the modern and modernist period is really key. So to keep up with the hunger for the new and the fact there was a means of reproducing it and disseminating it to us through the media, artists innovated like never before. And because artists saw more, they were more stimulated, they could turn things on their head, they could try new things, and also technology helped drive innovation and it created new forms like the feature film and multi-track recording. Of course, science fiction was the ideal genre to explore the novelty of how innovative technology caused social change that altered our consciousness and doing so through this media of mass production of magazines, books, films, what have you. Popular SF, however, was only modern in the artistic sense in a few cases. 
One of the earliest modern art movements was Futurism, and the Futurism was a movement started in 1909 by Filippo Tommaso Marinetti, an Italian, and this is his novel Mafarca the Futurist, which dates back to, let's have a look, I haven't read this for years, dates back to, let me see, um, I think it's around about 1912, yeah, and yeah, 1909, uh, first published um, in French and Italian in 2010. It was banned for obscenity. And this is the first Afrofuturist novel. That's right, it's the first futurist novel, and the character is a black African, and it's SF. So there you go. So Afrofuturism was invented by an Italian. There we are. It's not new. You think things are new and modern? They're not. They're just contemporary. This was genuinely new, so that's an interesting thing. If you want to learn about the links between futurism and science fiction, there's a video on the channel, which I filmed in Capri in Italy, um, set in the place where H.G. Wells' story A Dream of Armageddon was filmed, and explores the links between the story A Dream of Armageddon, which was published about 1901, and futurism a few years later. And Wells seemed to predict futurism and its birth in Italy in that story, so do watch that video. Futurism celebrated progress, technology, speed and war. And there's a quotation by Marinetti about how a speeding sort of racing car was more beautiful than the victory of Samothrace, which is a classical bit of statutory. And Futurism was for destroying old culture, celebrating the new, the modern. It operated in po painting, poetry, fiction, and it even birthed electronic music in the work of Rosolo, who created these machines, um, noise machines, and there are recordings in the first electronic music. And Marinetti, the founder of Futurism, as I say, he wrote this first Afrofuturist novel. So that's worth looking at. Futurism is more important to SF in terms of its conceptual links than anybody seems to realise. A couple of years after Futurism got going, um, Edgar Rice Burroughs produced The Princess of Mars, Tarzan the Apes and The Land That Time Forgot, all within about a year of each other, which is around about 1912. And that sort of laid the groundwork in the USA for the SF pop magazine explosion. Now, magazines had been going for a long time, publishing fiction. They weren't a new thing. And between H.G. Wells and 1925, when Hugo Gernsback, another European emigre, you'll notice these people are Europeans, um, created a magazine called Amazing, and he coined the term scientific fiction, which a fan a year later suggested, let's call it science fiction, scientific fiction, it's really hard to say, it's a jawbreaker. So science fiction as a genre in the modern, modernist sense, didn't exist before 1925. That's when it was named. Before they have scientific romance and before Shelley, you have proto-SF, the things which lead towards science. So science fiction really like futurism began by celebrating technology, the wonders of the way the future was going to be. And that was very much Gernsback's thing. It was a revolutionary thing to educate people about science. Or was it really? Was it just good, clean fun? But really this this sort of came after world war one and world war one was the moment when modernism really really became relevant because the old empires with their cavalries and their silly alliances which led to the deaths of millions of people who weren't ready for tanks which were new they weren't ready for poison gas which was new they weren't ready for machine guns which were new it was all blown away and it was terrible and people just you know, the, the ruling classes, the elites, they just treated people as cannon fodder. But even they were shocked by it. It began the downfall of the old imperial world and the modern world was fully born. Artists both acted and reacted to this through futurism, Dada, surrealism, and they championed abstraction and the oneric vision, the dream inside your head to show that there was more to human life than just what you could see or what was seeable. People had things inside their head which needed to get out there and the consciousness was changing and being changed by modernism. So, you know, you look, you look at things, if you take this, I mean, Dada and surrealism, really important art movements. They happened a long time ago. They were genuinely new. They had a small number of precursors. Now, hardly anything is really new. They were really shocking. If you look at these things in context, People think things are modern now. They're not. Nearly everything is old hat. That's the fact of it. If you look at the context of things and you become more appreciative of this as you discover more of the arts, you'll see that the new was quite some time ago. So all this was going on around about the time the birth and naming of the genre science fiction as a mass form. 
So post the Great War, modernism was the full artistic worldview and it was a historical and cultural period and it was full blown. Interestingly, of course, modernism was the antithesis of fantasy. Fantasy is escapist, nostalgic, traditional and anachronistic. It's the opposite of modern and modernism. The golden age of SF, which started in the late 1930s, coincided with World War II breaking up. There's something in that. The age of science fiction, satire and sociology coincided with the Cold War of the 1950s. I mean, let's look at some examples here. If we go back and let's see, Wells, Wells, the scientific romance, the turn of the century. He could see what was coming. He set the agenda. The Golden Age. Van Vogt, the first story in this, Black Destroyer, published in Astounding in 1939. 40 years later, it's filmed as Alien. Alien was filmed in 1979. People love Alien. They still think it's the new thing. I mean, I mean, that's 40 years ago. Come on. All right. So you've got to put these things into context to see what modern really means. So the Cold War of the 1950s, what happened then? America, you know, mass production, luxury come to the lower classes, post-war period. We'd never had it so good. Abstract expressionism was the key art form with Jackson Pollock dripping paint over things. And we had social SF like this, Paul and Kornbluth, Bester, Sheckley, Dick, all those sort of people. And, you know, satirized advertising and consumerism and, you know, this is not stuff in it about conservation. It's the 1950s. Everything you think is new isn't. It's just contemporary. It's just another take on things that have been going on for a long time. So, you know, this is what was happening. You see this forward movement of art and culture, and it's there in SF alongside the visual arts and everything else. In the 1960s, you have the new wave, the baby boomers, social change. People had grown up after the war. They had a bit more money in their pocket. You know, the pill had come along, so there was more sexual freedom. The Vietnam War, assassinations of presidents, LSD and the counterculture, pop art and rock music. And, you know, if you look at somebody, a classic new wave of J.G. Ballard. OK, that's got a surrealist painting on its cover and that's a 60s edition of The Crystal World. There you go. Why has it got a surrealist painting on it? Because Ballard references it. And because it's modernist, it's modernist with artwork. And, you know, when you get into the 70s, you see traditional SF and the avant-garde begin to merge, particularly in American SF, because the tide can't be held back any longer. People can't keep working on this manifest destiny tradition of space opera and aliens and conquest and all this nonsense. So, you know, you get works like this in the 60s, Indoctrinaire, which is about poison gas. Is this real? If you like Philip K. Dick, you love this. And, you know, you get people like M. John Harrison, who are bringing a new level of style into SF, taking traditional ideas and twisting them on their head. That was needed by them because things were getting very old and tired. And that's my point. A lot of the stuff that's coming out now is old and tired. It's not going anywhere new. It's not even presenting it in a new way. We saw even traditional things like this, the Forever War, your classic hard SF future war scenario, the sort of thing beloved of Heinlein and the right wing and, you know, the Golden Age guys. But Haldeman went to Vietnam. He experienced it. So this is an anti-war novel. It's got all the excitement and all the stuff you want from space opera, all the physics, the high drama, the colour. But it's got a different tone to it because it's making some points about society. It's a book then which reflected the modern world around it and it's still really popular. So if you look at the 70s, technology was really well established, but the methods of reproducing photography, film, music and tech began to move towards the digital. And the 1980s saw this happening in early PCs, in sampling keyboards particularly. Music was really the area where digital technology took off in a big way, you know. And if you look at music in the early 80s, when synthesizers moved on and stopped being analog and became digital, the music becomes increasingly the electronic and there's less of the acoustic element and the tone colours smooth out and, in my view, become less interesting. And we're beginning to see the end of the modern period. It's beginning to come to an end. By the end of the 80s, we saw the point where innovation and almost all the arts slowed right down. We'd had almost a century of modernism, a century of mass reproduction of photos, films, music. We'd been exposed to more culture in our lifetimes than anybody else in the whole of human history. It's worth repeating. 
business has sold us all this culture and it created an expectation in it that we should always have innovation, newness and novelty. People didn't have that before modernism. Things moved slowly. They moved slowly. But we became addicted to the modern, modernism, innovation and change. And we came to expect it as the norm. That's because it was the norm. But the fact was, we began to realise that we were running out, that the past had been mined, it'd been overturned, it'd been built on, it'd been escaped from, it'd been reinvented, and new ideas came out of it. And artists had, had gone from one thing to another, moved really quickly, the pace was incredible. And now what was new was actually last week's news, and we wanted new news. It wasn't enough for us. And what we got then in you know the late 80s, things start, stopped evolving, and really, we got cyberpunk was the last revolution. That was the early 80s. That was the last thing, cyberpunk. And of course, it owed something to the 70s and the punk thing. This was the last thing. If you talk about cyberpunk now, it was done 40 years ago. Why do you think you're interested in cyberpunk now when it was 40 years ago? If you listen to the music of 1965, then the music of 1975, and the music of 1985, you see vast differences between them. The difference in the music between 85 and 95 is smaller. Between 95 and now, there's hardly any difference. You see how it's slowed down? Things have not developed at all. They've gone back on themselves. They've squirreled into genres. It's all about the labels. The, the arts stopped evolving. Look at 1987, you've got the beginning of the space opera renaissance in British SF. The new wave had conquered things, had rubbed out the line in Britain between SF and the mainstream. And you know, it was it was all over. And then of course, you got Banksy doing his Consider Phlebas. You even got Colin Greenland, a new wave critic, doing Take Back Plenty. Space opera came back. It was people's expectation. They wanted real sci-fi. They wanted to go back to the past. They wanted to go back to the future. They were nostalgic for the future. They were haunted by it. The hauntology of SF. That's what they wanted. So that really was the end of modernism. So modernism began to end, and then you get a period called the postmodern begins. And the term postmodern was first used in reference to architecture. What is postmodernism? Well, you can read up on it, but fundamentally it's a distrust of grand narratives, of the sort of story I'm telling you now, where historically you can carve up culture and you can see the way that things arose. And some people say that that was just a blip and we're returning to a period where it's just artisanship and craft and people are mining things. People say, oh, well, there's no, nothing new under the sun, what have you. Well, during modernism, there were new things. There were. That's the thing. But it's a short period and it's over. And that's why the SF you're reading now is modern. Now, science fiction is only relevant, really, and it's only really good when it reflects a society around it. Science fiction is really always more about now and where we are now and what's happening to us now than you know about being about the future people think it's about the future and they retreat into the sort of familiar space fantasies but where is sf now well something that's big in sf now in sf publishing now is identity politics so if you are not male not white not european you've got a pretty good chance of getting into print and you know that's not a problem in lots of ways brian alder said the science fiction would never be mature until as many women as men read it i'm not so certain about that I think there's different expectations. And obviously we're talking very generally and broadly here. There are always exceptions that prove the rule. But if you look at identity politics, we're suddenly, we're seeing a huge number of names being published from eth what would be ethnic minorities in the UK or the States, of course, aren't worldwide at all. You know, we're seeing this happening. And is that a good thing? Well, you know, my view is this, it doesn't matter what somebody's identity is. What matters is how good is what they produce. And the problem for SF is that it's a modernist form. It's an innovative form. If not, it's traditionalist, and then as SF, it's not really very good. And it is hard. It's grown more and more difficult for artists to innovate because everything's been done. More and more has been done. So innovation is really hard to recapture. Now we're in the postmodern period. So let's talk about identity politics. You think it's new. It isn't new. Right, because SF was always ahead. 
identity politics, the great age of identity politics was the 1960s in America, civil rights, feminism, and this was in Europe as well. These are European things, they're Western things. You know, they're not new. Delaney, okay? Samuel R. Delaney, the black bisexual honorary professor of linguistics, won loads of Nebra awards in the late 60s, okay? Right, so nothing new. Yes, he probably was the exception that proved the rule then, but the whole point is that innovation, the point, the needle end of innovation in SF and modernism was that it was okay for somebody to be the exception to prove the rule because they would blaze the trail and open things up. You want to talk about LGBTQ plus and feminism, Ursula Le Guin, okay? Daughter of two anthropologists. This, you know, <laughs> people would say it's a transgender narrative. Narrative, no. These things aren't new. It's just that you're, if you're coming into it and you're young and you haven't read this stuff and you don't know about it, you think that the zeitgeist that's being represented to you is new and it's modern. It isn't. It's just contemporary. Modernism is over. Innovation is the real thing that marks modernism. And it's a real problem because cultural production has slowed down. If you want to read the works of Mark Fisher, Capitalist Realism is a really good one to read. And also Retromania by Simon Reynolds are two key texts. And I talk about those in, in other videos. Really, the real problem we've had in SF for a long time is the fact that it ceased to be innovative and really, you know, it's happened to everything. I'm not having a go at writers or artists or readers. It's happened in all the arts. We have a real problem. And you could say, well, you're an old guy of 60, you know, you're just being nostalgic. You like the things that when you were young. But I was aware of this in my late 20s. When I was listening to rock music in the early 80s, I could see that some of the things in the past were more interesting, more innovative than what's happening in the future. By the end of the 80s, you had dance music, you had this reproduced, and you had fewer, less of the human and innovative element in it. The technology would only take it so far. And if you study dance music, if you read Fisher and Reynolds, you know, they'll give you examples of this. They know far more about it than I do. So it's an interesting thing. And it's in SF, SF as a genre form since 1925. We mark its history and its evolution, its grand narrative. And you can try and take it apart if you want, but you will struggle to do so because postmodernism is its own grand narrative. To take apart a narrative, you have to rebuild another one and have an alternative story because we think in the linear arrow of time and we think in stories, we think in narrative. That's the way we are. So if you look at those things, revolutions you had the birth of mass media sf in the magazine culture the golden age the social science and sociological satirical sf of the 1950s the new wave the merging of new wave and traditionalism in the 70s cyberpunk in the early 80s and these aren't distinct periods with beginnings and ends the way the people do in comic fandom this is this is more of an evolutionary thing so science fiction's last revolution 1987 the british space opera renaissance well it wasn't a revolution it was rocketing back back into the past so that's why the science fiction that you're buying and reading now in most cases isn't modern isn't modernist you can say it's modern you can say it's of now but it's not modernist it's postmodern so really that's why i say contemporary sf as opposed to modern sf so have a think about that and think about what you've read is there anything you've read and i'm sure people will pop things and be saying oh have you read this this is really good and what have you and i'm sure and you know that's absolutely fine but the point is when you come up with almost any sort of work of sf from the last 30 years, you'll find it has precursors. And as I say, this is a problem for all the arts. You know, we are in that space. What is to be done? I don't know. I mean, <laughs> this is why I stepped away from SF for a long time in the early 90s, as I think I thought it was played out. And my 90s to be R, which, you know, is languishing. It's sort of some of this up there where you can see there is so get the finger on it. Some of it there is languishing there because I'm just seeing a kind of slickness. I've seen things done before and it was it was you know some of the writing's really good but good smooth easy to read writing is enough modernism is marked by difficulty and innovation and the genuinely new so what can we do about this at the end of the book um postmodernism for beginners the right to say 
the only cure for postmodernism is the incurable illness of romanticism is to go back and to resurrect the sublime. I think that's what we need to do. Perhaps we need a new wave of new wave. Whatever we do, we're stuck in the postmodern period, the endlessly contemporary. We can't recapture the modern. We can only reflect it. Maybe it's a hologram of what's going on. Who knows? So this is kind of petering out because that's the way that our culture leaves us. It leaves us exhausted because we've had so much. And if you're what if you're young and you're watching this, you're going to think, you know, this is old cynic. What does he know? Well, you know, you will come around. You will see. And, you know, seek out things. Let me know if you've read something that you think is genuinely modernist, that is genuinely innovative. And if you mention something that's really famous, I'm going to know about it. I'm a bookseller. You know, and look, go in your bookshop now and look at the tables and the shops. What do you see? You see tons and tons of generic fantasy romance, mostly written by young female writers for young female readers. Now, that's not a sexist comment. That's a fact. OK, that's a fact. And, you know, is it really innovative or is it just providing people with comfort food? I don't care who is by. I don't care what colour they are. I don't care what, care what gender they are. What I want is something that opens my head up this innovative. Is it innovative? Probably not. Anyway, I'm sure this will cause a storm of protest. This is Outlaw Bookseller signing up for now on why what you're reading isn't modern or modernist. It's contemporary. Bye for now. Mm -hmm.